So today we're going to be talking about uh, how to do security in a cloud. And you will hear from two practitioners. Myself, I'm Slavomir Legier, and I'm a Vice President of Engineering at Envision Cloud, the artist formerly known as Sky High. And here's Dan. Hi, I'm Dan Meacham. I'm the Vice President of Security and Operations for Legendary Entertainment. So all you guys that are here for MGM, I'm sorry, it's okay. <laughs> Legendary is cool. We'll go through a couple different things and we'll talk about our cloud journey and everything else and how we got here. So let's get started. On the agenda, we'll talk a little bit about uh, enterprise customer cloud journey and what are the challenges that come with moving to the cloud in general. And, and I don't really need to tell you much about it, but uh, you'll hear from us about it anyways. Uh, we'll talk about legendary entertainment and how legendary actually solved some of those challenges and made sure that when they migrated to the cloud, they make cloud more secure than on-premise environment could ever be. And finally, we'll be talking about how Envision Cloud helped Legendary actually to do that transition. Some of the takeaways that we want you to take from that are IIS cloud workloads must be very carefully designed because it's very easy to make mistakes. It's very easy uh, to actually create security holes in that environment because it's just so easy to do things here. It's easy to click and point and do something that will create security hall. You need to make sure that activities in the cloud are properly monitored and that you don't have compromised accounts there. And finally, storing data in the cloud has some challenges, challenges that are not necessarily present in, in your on-prem environment to the same degree because it's, again, so easy to misconfigure things uh, and leave things wide open uh, for others to, to get access to your data. So as you all know, cloud is growing very, very fast. And IES, or infrastructure as a service, is growing even faster than the rest of the cloud. 35, almost 36% versus SaaS applications at 22% year on year. And as we all know, if it grows at that pace year on year, it, it goes through the roof. Uh, we did a little survey uh, of our customers and uh, to determine you know, what they are doing in the cloud and what we found out that their data is really stored in three different categories of places. Uh, the largest amount of data is in enterprise SaaS applications. So your Office 365, uh, your Salesforce, et cetera, et cetera. That's where most of the data today is. IAS is about 24% right now, but it's growing very, very fast. When we looked at this chart uh, about three, four years ago, that miscellaneous slice, the 10% slice, uh, was actually the biggest slice of them all. That was over 60%, and that was shadow data. People were really, really concerned about where their shadow data is, meaning where the customers could go to the cloud applications and don't use uh, something that's approved by their organization. What do they do with that data? Where do they store it? Uh, and that slice went from 60% to 10%, while IES grew from pretty much zero uh, to 24% that it is today, and it's growing even more rapidly today. As we all know, when you go to the cloud, you're still very res much responsible uh, for making sure uh, that your application is secure, that what you do there is secure. Cloud service provider is responsible for part of it, but major part is still your responsibility. And it really depends on you know, what type of environment you are going to put yourself into. If you're in an on-premise environment, you're responsible for everything from physical security to data security to application security to, to uh, authentication itself. When you're moving to IAS or something like AWS, your responsibility goes down a little bit. So you're not responsible for physical security anymore, but you're still responsible for authentication. You are still responsible for your data. You're still responsible for, for a lot of the things uh, that you're moving to the cloud. And as you're moving to PaaS and SaaS, your responsibility diminishes and the responsibility of the vendor increases, but you are still responsible for, for making sure that your data is secure at the end of the day. Again, when we surveyed uh, our customers, we found out that average organization misconfigured services in IES on 14 times on average. Uh, which is actually pretty bad when you think about it. It means, you know, leaving open uh, AWS S3 buckets. It means not configuring your VPCs correctly, uh, things of that nature. 
So 14 misconfigurations on average in, in any given organization. When we look at the DLP incidents, so data leak prevention, uh, and basically looking at where your data is going and, and the information that you want to protect, is it going to the places that it shouldn't go? Average organization has about 1,500 incidents per month in IS and PaaS services. Okay, just think about it. 1,500 data files, items that should be confidential, uh, are potentially lost or exposed uh, each and every month. The big question is, you know, when you look at, uh, think about when your sensitive data is in the cloud, is how do you detect, A, that it's lost, B, do you have any malicious or potentially insider activity in the cloud that you don't control? Uh, you don't have as much visibility a lot of times in the cloud as you used to have in, in your on-prem environment. Well, great. Thanks. And so let me tell you a couple of different things about Legendary and how we got to where we are today for in our particular cloud journey. So if you don't know who Legendary is, we're the one with the Celtic knot. And so we've done movies such as the Dark Knight Rise series, uh, uh, as well as Hangover. Um, we've done things with Warner Brothers and Universal and so forth. So Interstellar, straight out of Compton, Jurassic World. So these are some different things. But in our threatscape and how we look at different things, we basically have two main camps. One is the corporate side, and then the other side is the actual production and the film side. So on the corporate side, we have about maybe 325 users or employees, and we have some contractors in there as well, and which is kind of staggering when you think about that we actually have $17 you know, billion worth of assets and movies that are out there in revenue, which is just kind of crazy. But if we take a look at the production side, you know, when we start a movie, we may start with like six writers. And that movie may last, uh, the whole life cycle may take up to 18 months to two years to do, and it can swell up to about 2,000 users at a particular time, or staff members and crew members and everything else out there, from the guys that do the, the rigging to the ones that actually do the visual effects and everything else. And so we have a couple different dynamics, and it's not like we only just do one movie at a time, we may be doing several different movies at a time as we look at that. But you know, the other thing to look at is we've done about 58 movies so far, and we have a lot of television properties as well. So if you like Lost in Space on Netflix, that was us. If you didn't like Looming Tower on Hulu, well, okay, I can tell you it wasn't, but it was us. But <laughs> we, um, we see ourselves more as a content creator. And so with that particular end, when we look at creating the content, we partner with other studios to do the distribution for us. And so that's why when you watch a movie, you'll see multiple lo logos at the beginning. So like the two movies that we did this year, Soup to Nuts, that were ours, Detective Pikachu and then Godzilla, King of Monsters, uh, we wrote the stories, we did all the filming on set, we coordinated with all the different vendors and everything else to, to create the package, and then we handed it over to, Univer or to Warner Brothers, and then Warner Brothers took that to the theaters, and they'll take it to the DVD. They'll do the aftermarket you know, trinkets that you buy at Target or any other retail store or t-shirts and everything else, but they do the home uh, product services with that. But when you think about the space and when we look at in doing a, a movie in some of the other different areas, you know, right now, um, we have about almost four petabytes of data in-house. And so when we shoot a movie out on set, it's all digital, and it's done in these basically crates. And then when we have the, all the, the set material and everything collected, we'll just roll that crate into like our, our offices or to our studio and plug them in so we have 60 gigabit to the desktop. But also to give you a characteristic, so right now with four petabytes, we really only are doing two shows right now in-house. We have a couple more that are out in the field that will be coming back in later, unlike you know, like the larger studios which do 18 movies a year, which is ridiculous if you think about the size. Um, and then also put it into perspective, like the Godzilla movie we did, one monster, one model, which you know, one monster may have like 18 models to it, was about 15 terabytes of data that we have to have for the rigging, the, the textures, the colors, and everything else that goes into the visual effects with that. And so, so that's pretty insane when we look at the data size. And we only have about two petabytes of data worth of corporate data in-house or that we work with is, as well. Because we also do Nerdist, Geek and Sundry, which are streaming videos and things like that. And we also do comic books. Who would ever thought about comic books? But when we look at Legendary as a whole and we start talking about where all this data sits and everything else, we kind of need to take a step back and understand what does the universe look like that we have and then how do we get to where we are today? So. It's a, there's a couple of different pieces, so let's go to the next slide here, and we'll spend quite a bit of time talking through this. So when Legendary first started out, there was a couple of guys sitting around a table saying, dude, I love movies, this is really cool. So they thought, well, let's get in the movie business. And so the way we started was we invested money into productions, 
and then we got revenue back from those investments. So we've always treated uh, a movie as an investment to the company. And then eventually we've done enough of those investments over time, we thought, let's actually go and start shooting our own movies. And then we started building from those different pieces. So we partnered with Warner Brothers early on, and they allowed us to stay on their, their lot, and we used a lot of their infrastructure and everything else associated with that, which was great. And then about, so 12, 11, 12 years later, we decided that we had enough revenue ourselves that we wanted to have our own place. So we have this beautiful tower, it's right between Warner Brothers and Disney, and we picked it so that way we can look down on the other studios and put you know, graphics of Godzilla on the glass, it looks like they're stomping on them and stuff, but you know, that's, that's a different piece altogether. But it's a lot of fun. But when we look at it, and we decided to move off of Warner Brothers lot in 2013, we're like, we don't really want a data center, we want to be cloud first. And so that's when we really pushed everything to be cloud first. And in 2013, it's a lot different than it is now when you look at different pieces. And so when we started this whole venture into this particular space, you know, we had a third party that put our Microsoft Exchange server on their system and they, and they managed it for us, which was fine. Uh, but you know, there was a lot of security things that we couldn't necessarily do with it, like putting in an email gateway or some other different pieces to protect that email system. And when we chose some other different products out there, you know, we had all of our cloud applications as separate systems. And the idea behind that is if one got compromised, it doesn't impact the other data, right? So we felt that, hey, this was kind of a really good security model, but when you, know, you go from 17 employees to 100 employees to a little bit bigger, and you have this cloud-focused, cloud-first mentality, well, then what happens is, is, well, the marketing department decides that, you know, well, we're cloud, so we're gonna go ahead and, you know, sign an agreement with these other folks over here, or creative, and creative's really, they're the ones that we really have to work with a lot because they will send files anywhere and everywhere unencrypted, and you're like, no, we've gotta put some containment around this because we don't want any data leaks. And so then this is when we had to take a step back and said, great, we're using these different cloud applications. How do we lasso the security around that as a whole? And so, yeah, sure, there's single sign-on, but you know, are you putting all your eggs in one basket? Sure, there's MFA, you know, what's the risk associated with that? So in 2014, 2015, decided that we're gonna focus on a user-centric security architecture. So if your phone is trustworthy enough to trust you based off the biometric and your phone knows who you are and you carry that with you all the time, why can't we build a circle of trust around that particular device? And then from that particular device, we can incorporate other different areas. So we wanted to protect the user, we wanted to protect the device, we wanted to protect the data. So that's kind of the path we started to look at. And then this is when Office 365 really started to take off in the cloud. So by moving off of a hosted exchange server, and basically your infrastructure as a service over to a, an actual cloud application, that gave us a lot more capability on what we could do security-wise with that environment because now we own it versus having a third party manage it for us in a multi-tenant where we couldn't add things to it. So as we started to go down this particular journey, that's when we said, well, how do I really trust who we have and how we work on these different pieces? And so that is when we started to look at the single sign-on and using certificates and, and enabling the device. So then that way, if, um, because as you make a movie, I could be in Los Angeles, I can be in Budapest, I can be in Tokyo, we could be in any place in around the world, but yet we have to be able to access the data, but we need to be able to have a trusted space around that particular piece, and that's what we looked at. So when we started to work through this whole particular piece, which was great, so we have our, our SOC, we have our SIM, we were getting all this data, we're seeing all these different things, but we were missing something when we were looking at how we do this. So we know we have the contextual and the logistical and geographical things. So then if I'm in Los Angeles and in the office, things work differently than when I'm at Starbucks or when I'm in Romania. But the other things too, when we had to look at the user behavior analytics and put the other different components in there, is that if I'm logging in in a hotel lobby computer in Romania, but my phone and my other devices are still in Los Angeles, we wanna terminate that session, no access whatsoever. If I'm at grandma's house on Thanksgiving and I need to move a script to a particular talent so they could see it, well, grandma's computer is not in my trusted circle, but if my phone is with me, then I can do things in a VDI or in a cloud space on grandma's computer and not worry about her computer being infected and not impacting our data that we have there as we move that script to the talent. 
or I can actually enroll grandma's computer into my circle, which then forces her to look at a compliance scale and then fix everything on her machine. And then once I'm done, I click a button and everything just disappears on there like I was never there. And so these are the different things that we like, hey, this is a great idea, this is what we're going to move into. But what it really didn't help us address was all of this shadow IT stuff that we had out there. And so early on in you know, like 2013, 14, and so forth, when we looked at all the different CASB components out there, it was always around data loss prevention or shadow IT. And in our business model being cloud first, our office is treated like a library. Yeah, everybody comes together to work on a project. It doesn't matter which studio or anybody else that you work with because everything we did was in the cloud. And so the whole thing about shadow IT and monitoring that was, you know, like, well, how would we apply that? And then the other different component, when we look at some of those other different things on the, the, the cloud applications and how they integrate, is how do I trust the user? How do I trust these other different pieces? And how do I really know what they're up to? And how do I make sure my, my systems are secure? And so that's when we started to look into the next particular phase, because our, our SIM that we had did an excellent job of saying, hey, this user just downloaded 5,000 files in the last two minutes. That's a flag. Somebody might be stealing your data, right? But then, you know, it's great to know that, but we need to have something take action and how we automate those different types of pieces. And so we can write certain scripts inside the SIM to, for specific applications and everything else. But then that's when we revisited the whole CASB architecture. So if I can put a lasso around all my cloud applications with a set policy, then I can take action on that policy. So in the case where we may have somebody download 5,000 users, we can have that written up as a particular action trigger within our CASB. So it doesn't matter what platform you're on, if you trip that, it's going to trigger a response and we'll be able to suspend an account. We can do different things to where we can have an account to be suspended for a set period of time, or we may have to engage and do activities. So real world example, we had a uh, particular situation where we had an email that was stuck in quarantine. And well, since granted our size, we don't really have a direct Microsoft representative, right? So we have to go through partners to get our Microsoft support. And so our particular partner in this particular case had an engineer that overachieved. He decided to take actions in his own hands and actually created an account, escalated that account to uh, global admin privileges, and then started a, um, a compliance report. So basically doing e-discovery on the mailbox to try to pull that email out so he could release it. Well, that tripped all of our flags and within 19 minutes we had the whole thing disabled. And but 19 minutes seems like it's great, but it really took us over 12 minutes to get the data back from Microsoft before we could take action on it. So Microsoft is our biggest issue on getting the logs and activity from them. But it's those different types of things that, you know, if we didn't have the things in place, especially with the CASB and, and our SOC and everything else, we may not have necessarily seen that. And you're thinking, hey, you know, 19 minutes is great because when we had something like that happen to us, it took us six months. But if you think about how much data we have today and how fast things move, 19 minutes, you know, you could probably take eight movies from us pretty easily. And that, that'd be catastrophic to us or leak out a particular message or a particular image or a particular script. So those are some of the different things that we work with. So when we work within the CASB's perspective, that's where we started to, to look at some of these different actions because the other actions that we run into is if you all of a sudden changed 5,000 files in less than a minute, or uploaded 5,000 files in less than a minute, you're thinking, well, that's not that unusual. Well, if you had a crypto locker, that's a flag. And that's also one of the different trigger points we look at is, so when we see mass file movements or different types of activities that are different from a user based off of how they normally operate in a given day, it's gonna lock down the account. Our users are okay with this because they recognize that security comes first and we really work through all these different pieces. Um, and we, have, we are very transparent when it comes to the security. Because like we had another incident that we had somebody uh, visited a news article and embedded in the web page was an advertisement. And it just so happens that a hacker group bought the advertisement. And so when they hit that web page, it downloaded binaries inside of a PNG file and tried to execute within the browser because all that is kind of trusted. And we were able to stop and catch that. But that's where you know, cloud first and looking at all the other different pieces and how you kind of orchestrate these things together is really important. So when we look at this particular stuff that we're talking about now, it kind of leads into the next thing is the insider threat. And the insider threat on our side is the creative department that wants to share information to other different uh, studios or other places or to a freelance writer and they just send it in an email or they use this free service or my favorite. So 
We used to do all these different things in security, right, to keep different people out. And then a couple of years ago, we were bought by a Chinese company, Wanda. And so we had a large Beijing office, and now our Beijing office has really grown, especially for the market. So now uh, a lot of the movies we do do incredibly well in China. They love the stuff that we do, whether it's you know, Pacific Rim or, or a Godzilla movie or The Great Wall and things like that. But you got to love our folks in our Chinese office because, one, they love torrent networks because there's so many things that you can and can't do in China, so they will do it on torrent network. We're like, look, don't be torrenting movies because we are a movie company. So if you take other people's movies, it doesn't look good. And so we see all this type of activity when we try to do a lot of coaching. So then they try to be a little bit smart, and so we see a lot of VPN access. We're like, no, if you're gonna use VPN, use our VPN. Uh, partly because it's not like there's anything inside our office that you'd be VPN into anyway because everything is in the cloud. It's more so than that way have a, a US IP address because if you're looking at Netflix and other different streaming content, you wouldn't be able to get to see the content that we need. So when we monitor this stuff in the insider threat, lo and behold, they love the free VPNs. And every once in a while when we're inside our CASB and we're looking at, you know, we look at, you know, failed logins, but we always look at successful logins because that's really important. And when you look at the world map and you see 14 in Russia, you're like, what's going on? And then you look at the 14 users and they're all from the Chinese office because they're using some free VPN. You're like, you know, this is probably not the smartest decision that we need to work through. Let's go back through some other different finds. And so this is where having other technologies to look at the insider threat really helps us to drive some of these different pieces home. So in our cloud journey, going from 2013 to where we are today, you know, having this cloud first mentality was kind of a, 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 you know, all my life, 20 plus years, securing inside a data center. And they bring you in and say, we're going cloud first. You're like, holy buckets, how are we gonna do this? And so then going in that particular journey, you know, you think about, okay, well basically all we're doing is taking our servers and putting them in somebody else's place, right? But now you gotta move from there to say, well, what are the actual applications? And what are the applications, how do they integrate, and then how we work through that? So how do I create that lasso? So then that's when we decided to look at the security or the, the SaaS offerings to transfer some of that liability, but then lasting around that with your single sign-on and creating that whole user-centric security architecture. And so now we're kind of at that next phase on where we're gonna go because when 5G comes, there's like, oh, it's 5G, no big deal, everything's just gonna be faster. No, think of it from this perspective. When you had your original Apple TV box, right? It was like a massive hard drive. Everything was on that Apple TV so you could watch on your television. And then when we had faster internet at home, they went to a device that streams. So you think about your Chromecast and your other different devices. So when we go to 5G, your actual cell phone itself may actually become smaller and lighter because they don't need that much on there because it's constantly connected and you don't have to have all that data resident on your device. So these are the things that we gotta stay forward looking at. So when we look at what that next step is with this whole 5G and the internet of things, what does that really mean on how I can protect and capture all that information to secure my data, to secure my users, and to secure my devices? And so to kind of lead into some of that, let's kind of talk through some of the concepts and constructs that we can look at from a CASB architecture. Yeah, and Dan, I mean, would it be fair to say that uh, you had two problems to solve really at the end of the day? One was you needed agility. You needed to be able to go from zero employees to thousands of employees working on a movie in a matter of days. And cloud really helped you solve that problem, right? Exactly. And then the second problem that you had, you had to do it in an extremely secure manner. And Cloud Application Security Broker, or CASB, allowed you to actually gain the visibility and control over all these clouds and cloud applications. Exactly, because like what we were talking earlier today, we are wrapping up a set, uh, a, shoot, a shoot in Budapest for our upcoming movie, Dune. And you know they want to scale things pretty drastically, and it's nothing like getting a call and say, hey, I need this within 36 hours. And you're like, well, how are we gonna dynamically scale this? And this is where being cloud first allows us the agility to, to do those different types of things. But then also on the corporate side, you know, it's kind of in a, in a particular box. So very dynamic. Yeah, so, so when you go to IIS, I mean, the use cases that we really see are uh, listed right here. Uh, security configuration and monitoring of your resources. So you need to really see what resources out there and are they all configured correctly? You need to be able to manage your rogue IS accounts. It's so easy right now to spin up a new account in AWS or Azure or anywhere else. A credit card and a few thousand dollars give you access to the supercomputer today. 
And you need to make sure that when people use these supercomputers, they use them for good, not for bad. Uh, you need to have visibility into your confidential data, and this is something that's really near and dear to legendary. Uh, you want to expose on that a little bit? Oh my gosh, yeah, because <laughs> being able to track where that data is going, but we'll walk through some of these other different things, especially you know, on the, the visibility of our content and where it's flowing. Because uh, again, you know, like I had mentioned, the marketing department being able to move files, and but the challenge that you have with a lot of the data loss prevention technology that's out there today, a lot of it is on meta tagging and and doing some sort of data classification. So if you're going to say these are good and these are bad, I need to know how do I define this is good and this is bad. But unfortunately, in our architecture, if I put tags on certain types of artifacts, it will break the editing process. So I can't, you know, I can't tag this, you know kaiju model of a monster and have it, you know, proprietary. Maybe I could do that with, you know, say a script or something like that. But if I'm sending a script out to talent, they're not going to want to log in with an MFA into a thing just to read a PDF file. They want it to be emailed or just click a link and it's there. And so that creates a lot of different dynamics on how we protect that. But we need to have a way to have visibility to monitor where those things go. So then once we know that that was received or delivered, then we can lock down that link or we can watermark certain different types of content. And having that extra uh, visibility on where the data flows and what happens on the other end was basically very critical to us on how we operate as a business. Yeah, and finally, you talk about activity monitoring and the user-centric oh my gosh. protection, that, right? Which was really critical. That is critical. The, the key thing that we've been working on the last couple of years is you know, everybody talks about user behavioral analytics, but in all honesty, you know, the way you type is, is it's a signature on how you operate. How, what you do on your phone, the hours in which you do it, compared to what you do on a computer. So we have to pull all this different data from the different devices and how you use that device in those specific locations, allow us with the intelligence and the machine learning to know that when there's that one thing off, we can stop it right away. Because prior to going to this full user security architecture model that we did, we would see that we'd have a compromised account and based off the different activities. And so that's where we reverse engineer to say, how do we say this is normal and this is not? And we continue to work with McAfee today to help define those analytics and those, those capabilities with it as well. Yeah, and we, when we talk about analytics, I mean, my team uh, obviously build the product, I'm a vendor, but at the same time, I'm also a user and practitioner here uh, because we are using AWS uh, as our primary platform uh, and we are storing a lot of activities, a lot of events, and we're running a lot of analytics on it. And by a lot, I mean a lot. Uh, we're talking 8 billion events a day. Mm -hmm. 8 billion, let it sink in. I mean, this is one event per person per day in the world, right? So everybody in the world, <laughs> if they've had one event, will get to 8 billion. So that's, that's very, very large scale. Uh, and our customers are all coming in a very, very large scale at the end of the day. Uh, so here are some of the threats uh, that you really face when you talk about moving to IAS. Misconfiguration is one of them. Uh, rogue IAS accounts, confidential data leaking, uh, rogue users, and finally compromised accounts. Let's talk a little bit about misconfiguration of IAS resources or AWS resources, because it's just so easy to do and it could be so damaging uh, to your environment. Uh, when you look at the configuration, uh, it's very, very easy, as I said, to, to misconfigure something in AWS or Azure or any other IES environment. By default, they're really set up to be configured in a fairly safe way. Uh, but there's so many knobs and dials, as you all know, that it's very easy to click something uh, that will cause, uh, for example, S3 bucket to be open to the world. Uh, yeah. And we see in average customer account about 102 uh, unique configuration checks and policies that we do, and a lot of them are misconfigured, I've seen, heard before. Exactly. So when we originally brought the CASB in, it was really to look at the SaaS applications. And then when we onboarded our AWS instances into our, our CASB and started to get this particular data, we realized how vulnerable we really were in given areas, especially on movies that were like 
10 years ago that had different buckets and things that were set up that we thought were secure that were not necessarily secure. And so what this particular piece allowed us to do in this particular environment was not just to have another vulnerability scanner and another risk ranking component, but then it also allowed us to do some fine tuning on some of the different policies. So if we were to replicate or spin something else up, it would detect it. Not only would we get the notifications, but we can also program it to take corrective action as necessary, which was very helpful considering that we had um, at one point in our lives, we had an engineer that decided instead of doing DNS redirects, he was going to create all these different servers in AWS to do the redirect for us versus having it done at the top level with the DNS server. So, you know, it's like cost economics, like, are you, are you nuts? What's going on with this? And then we found all these different things and we literally had a thousand and we were able to redirect and correct all that within a matter of a couple hours after discovering it. Fortunately, you know, security by obscurity, nothing ever really happened. There wasn't anything to write or post and it was a blessing in disguise. But configuration is, is a real world issue that we have to take a look at. And it's not just the engineers, it could be a vendor or somebody else that you're working with. And so we need to have some way that you can trust your, your associates and your vendors that, that they have good hygiene as well. Yeah, and uh, as we said, not only administrators, but others can also misconfigure resources. And you make, need to make sure that when this mis misconfiguration is detected and it's corrected, we can automatically resolve that incident. So you don't need to go back and click anything anymore. You just fix the problem, and the problem will be fixed uh, in, in our console, which makes it really, really easy. Uh, actually, right here at this conference, we are introducing our Envision Cloud Shift Left. Uh, and what that really means is we want to move security much closer to the time of the development or deployment uh, of the resources or, or actual creation of the environment itself. Uh, as you all know, a lot of you, I'm sure, are using CloudFormation. How many of you are using CloudFormation right now at AWS? Yeah. There you so it so looks like more than half at least. And, and some of you who don't uh, raise your hand, probably you don't know that your de DevOps teams are, are using CloudFormation. Uh, but it's, it's one way to automatically actually create entire environments. So speed up, spin up servers, spin up the VPCs, uh, set up the network, set up users, everything with a script and a click of the button. It's, it's that easy. And, and what you need to do before you do that, before you actually click that button to create the environment, you need to make sure that what you are creating is really done in the right way, in a way that's secure, that, that complies with all the policies. Uh, I mean, personally, there's nothing worse from my perspective uh, than to develop actually something, deploy it, and then have the OPSEC team come in and tell me how many uh, holes do I have in my environment. Because then I have to stop everything and redo, right? If I can do it right up front before I actually deploy my environment or create my environment and do all those checks up front, then I can be assured that at the end of the day, my environment is secure, right? The earlier I do it, the better it is for me, and that's why we, we need to move left, move uh, everything as close, all the checks as close to the development team and, and early DevOps team as possible so we are not surprised at the later stage and, and waste our time uh, remediating things rather than doing it right, thing, right way uh, at the start. Absolutely. Rogue IS accounts. I mean, this is, this is a real problem uh, for a lot of our customers. We really see uh, a lot of shadow use of AWS. As I said, it's so easy with the credit card uh, to set up AWS account, start spinning up servers, start putting data there, and you don't know where it's all going. So we can really enforce governance and policies uh, and make sure that only approved IS accounts are used. Uh, and it, it's bad for two reasons. I mean, one is security. Uh, but just Im as important is cost. I mean, when people start spinning these accounts, putting it on credit cards, you know, the cost starts getting out of hand pretty quickly because then they try to bring this credit card on the PO and, and you know, the whole account grows and grows. And it wasn't really something that was sanctioned in the first place that should be there in the first place. That's right, you know, trying to bring it into an enterprise platform. But the other thing too, when we look at some of these different pieces on how, on how we have these rogue pieces out there is not necessarily a particular division like our uh, gaming division deciding to spin something up as it was that we had worked with a third party that was developing content with us and, and they actually had an account inside the AWS environment and so forth. So you got to really double check and, and look at some of those different pieces and how they operate and get that visibility. Now there's a lot of different tools out there to help with these different capabilities, but you know, just put it on the back of your mind, your checklist to say, you know, hey, 
if anything I get out of this, I gotta make sure my configuration's good, I gotta check my users. I mean, there's a lot of different things that you gotta do that's on any kind of control framework anyway. But how can we make that better? How can we make that faster, more efficient? And more importantly, how do we make it automated? It's where it's a system generated system process so you don't have to spend the hours a day hunting these different things down as we go through it. Yeah, so just out of curiosity, uh, in your own environment, uh, how many of you have under five accounts, AWS accounts, in your entire organization? Yeah. You see like two hands, I think. How many of, the, of, of you have under 10? Yeah. Few Same. more, uh, under hundred. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, almost everybody uh, over hundred. Yep. Wow, that, that, that's actually that's actually a lot of people over hundred, comparatively speaking. Uh, so so there could be a lot of AWS accounts and trying to manage all of this and trying to figure out which ones are legit and which ones are just something that your uh, engineers spun up uh, just for their own purposes is is always a challenge. Yeah. Uh, and again, uh, when you identify it, uh, we can make sure that they are locked down, that uh, people don't have access to them, and that we can remediate all of that. Yeah. So before we jump into confidential data, so I know we talked about configuration, and we talked about some of these other different things with the rogue accounts and everything else like that. It's like, great, these are like pocket solutions. But if you can pull all these solutions together in a much broader sense, so then that way you're actually looking at, you know, not just the configuration, but what are the actions and the activities and the access that's going on in this particular phase gives you a little bit more visibility. So when we start looking at the confidential data leaks, you know, some of that may be spawned by the, the configuration component. So if we find that we have a leak or uh, an incident here, we can then tie it back and we can look to auto-correct in other different areas as well. So let's talk a little bit about that. Yep. So where are the data? I mean, it Confidential data can span the gamut. I mean, a lot of companies are concerned about social security numbers, driver license numbers, uh, credit card information, et cetera. You are most concerned about? Con this picture. So <laughs> Movies. a lot of different things that you know, we look at from this perspective. I mean, we do have talent data. We do have addresses and bank accounts and things like that and how we pay invoices. And so we have certain triggers to watch for that. But a lot of times when we have um, a picture leak out from a set that's not supposed to be there, then that's, you know, the security by security, we will actually probably say, oh, that's not actually from this particular movie, that's from Ready Player One or something like that. So we do a lot of misinformation to throw people off on the content. That's basically what most studios do. That's why you have these YouTube influencers and you just give them a little bug and they think it's a leak and it will totally deviate the whole leak that you were trying to avoid in the first place. Not like that's a secret or anything. So how do I get Tom Hanks' phone number? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this particular box, this is what's dear and true to my particular heart. You know, the, when you look at the configuration and the applications and everything else out there, a lot of that is system driven. But where we see a lot of the challenge that we have is the human element on how the users interact with the environment. And then how do we monitor that? How do we trust that that is normal activity? How do we separate different things? So we think about when after 9-11 happened, and we changed all the security that we had within the airport system itself. It wasn't so much about trying to find who the terrorist is before they get on the plane, as it was how, who can we eliminate as not a terrorist. And so doing the reverse lookup or looking at the behavior of the data itself in that particular perspective, then you can cut off 80, 90, 99% of this is not interesting to look at versus trying to find where the obscure becomes obvious. And so when we start looking at these activities and the monitoring and everything else, this is uh, totally invaluable. So those little red spikes there, those are the anomalies that it helps to pick up. And you can help drive some of these different things. There's a lot of different things that are out of the box, such as anomalies that say, hey, you know, you had a lot of activity in your AWS environment, or hey, you had this particular user log in from two different locations that are improbable within five minutes. So if you don't have a single sign-on, but yet you have multiple cloud applications, when you have it incorporated into a, a CASB architecture, you'll see that this user logged into Los Angeles in Box, and this user checked their email in Tokyo, and it all happened within 15 minutes. So then you gotta ask yourself, is there a VPN involved, or are there other different risks and everything else associated with it? And so this is when you start looking at that whole user-centric piece to say, where is the user really, and where are their devices? Now, say for example, maybe I did go to Tokyo, but I left my iPad back at home. And as I get email on my phone, I get email on my iPad. 
Well, because it's at home and that's a normal activity and we know that sometimes you forget that, you don't take it to the office or with you when you travel, that we can associate that particular behavioral to the learning process. But it would still come up as, as an anomaly that we still want to check and then close out to say, you know, thanks for telling us about it, don't take action, versus if we see all your devices over here and you logged in for the first time on a mobile device or you logged in for the first time on, you know, a hotel lobby computer, you know, you're going to see this in the activity monitoring and that should be a flag and it should automatically take action to disable activity or other different components that you have within that particular space. So, again, if you don't have things where all your accounts are linked together, at least have something so you have visibility of all the activity things going on, in, you know, whether it's inside your SOC or what have you. But what's really nice in this particular piece is all the APIs kind of work together. So you can actually see what's going in on inside you know, your AWS, what's going inside your SaaS applications or your infrastructure applications as a whole. And you don't really have to code anything because it's kind of already here. Yep, well, very well stated. And we can do a lot of investigations. Uh, we can make sure that uh, you know, we hone in appropriate activities. We make sure that they are not false positives, that they are something that we need to uh, act on. And we can actually prevent these things from happening at the end of the day, now, uh, which is really, really important. Now, I will tell you from the forensics perspective, you know, we were looking at all of our Microsoft logs. We were looking at all of our SIM logs, our Splunk logs, and everything else. We actually got more data out of the CASB component when it came to some of the login information on what it was able to pull out of the Microsoft than what Microsoft was able to give us. So we could even go all the way down to the cell carrier as to what was going on on that particular piece. So um, a few years ago, if somebody were to compromise your iCloud account, and then they were to restore your phone on their phone in a different country, they would get a lot of the different tokens and there's different ways that they can reactivate those different things. So you wouldn't necessarily need an MFA or an app password because it would just work because you restored the device. And this allowed us to get a lot of details into that so we can say, you know, let's, you know, this is a flag, this is a trigger, these are different types of things that we want to monitor and take a look at. And so um, if anything, you know, it's how you get the data, then what do you do with that particular data? And again, it's nice to get an alert, but it'd be better if I can invoke an action associated with that particular activity. And, you know, that's, that's one of the different things that you got to think about with all the different cloud applications and how you orchestrate what your playbook's going to be when you have this type of action and activity. Yep. Yep. Very well said. And on advanced threat protection, uh, I mean, we can correlate this multiple activities and, and uh, potential threats and really elevate them to the real, real threats that you have to take action on, or you can automate some of these actions, as Dan mentioned. That's right, because, you know, we see spikes a lot when we have failed logins. It's like, okay, so that's great. Somebody has figured out what our user IDs are, and they're trying to walk the entire system. But it's when you see that huge spike, and then all of a sudden it goes silent, then what does that mean? Do they get in? You know, let's take a look at some of the other different activities, and this allows you to, to group things, move things around, you know, just not anything different that you already have today in some of your SOC capabilities, but it's something to think about when, if you're moving through the cloud, how do I get this information that I may have already had when it was inside my data center, but if it's in somebody else's stuff, how do I work with them to get that information? And then sometimes they may not be able to give that information in, in a timely manner or in a particular way. So then how do I work with the API? How do I coordinate some of those other things? So maybe I do have this particular SIM over here that pulls in these logs, but there's not an app associated or a REST API associated with that right, readily available. There's a lot of work and coding in there. But if I can put it in over here and it's by default and then I can start pulling these things in, and then based off of just the high level pieces, those high level policies apply regardless of where the data comes from. It looks at the activity and allows us to have that more advanced threat protection at a much, either a macro or even a micro level. Yeah. Very well said. And, and uh, the thing to stress here, as I said, we, we are processing 8 billion events for our customers each day. And you don't need to necessarily set the exact policy or a threshold. Uh, we can automate this modeling. We can use some machine learning to make sure that we actually have the activities and anomalies that turn into threats and only threats that are really actionable and reduce the number of false positives to the, to the absolute minimum level. So let me talk a little bit about you know, how do we partner with AWS today. Uh, when we build our platform, we build it across all the SaaS, PaaS, and IS applications, and that's really the power of it, that brings all of it together. And what we don't want to do, we don't want to duplicate uh, what our cloud providers are already doing. So AWS does a very good job with AWS Security Hub, for example, and we want to make sure that we fully embrace it and extend it. 
So rather than build Security Hub over again, we, we will get all the information from Security Hub, we'll get the information to Security Hub, and we'll work with it to make sure that our solution at the end of the day enhances it, and it's truly cross-platform. So it's not only for AWS, but for all the other IAS platforms, as well as SaaS platforms. Uh, we did achieve AWS competency uh, just this year. Uh, we are a long-standing APN partner. We have a lot of customers. One of them is right here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and our solution is fully vetted by AWS. Uh, it, it is the only CASB cloud application security broker with AWS security competency. So that, that's an important thing to remember. Uh, when we look at our platform strategy, as I said, it's not something that we want to look at as, as, as one slice, uh, one provider, uh, one type of solution. Uh, it's really something that's very, very broad that goes end to end for all your cloud journey, and it helps you with the entire cloud journey. As you heard from Dan, it's not only about AWS and IIS, it's also about SaaS, it's also about PaaS, it's also about every other application that's out there in the cloud. Yes. Do you want to add anything to that? <laughs> it's just a big threat scape. That's all you gotta know. Okay. Uh, we're a device to cloud company with the network in between. So on the device, what we can control, we can control DLP, we can control encryption, uh, threat protection, etc. on the device itself. In a cloud, again, we can do DLP in a cloud, which, which not too many people can do today. Uh, we can do your configuration management for IES and PaaS services. Uh, we do threat protection and, and everything else. And all of that comes into one place. So there's one policies or set of policies that you define for all of these applications, and you have one single pane of glass to actually view all the incidents and, and everything else that's happening in the cloud. So it's really easy for your SOC uh, to correlate all of that information and have one single view. And, and I think that's what you've heard from Dan today. So as you progress on your cloud journey, I mean, you really need to plan carefully and make sure that you always audit what you do and reduce the risk and, and reduce the potential data loss. A lot of data goes into the cloud. Make sure that you have really good handle on what that data is. Uh, you need to monitor the cloud activity on your users, especially if your user base is shrinking and growing, just like in, in case of Legendary. If you grow from zero employees to 2,000 employees on a movie, you know, not all of them can be fully vetted, right? Yeah. <laughs> or fully trusted. So you need to make sure that you really uh, monitor what they're doing, how they're doing it, and, and that nothing leaks at the end of the day. Uh, and finally, storing uh, that data in, in the cloud environment is a little bit different than storing it just on your premise. You no longer have this perimeter that you can secure and say everything goes through my firewall, so I'm going to look through my firewall logs to see what, what goes in and out. It's all in the cloud. It's moving from one cloud application to another. It's moving from S3 bucket uh, to Office 365 or to Azure or Google Cloud or anywhere else, uh, and you need to have full visibility and control over that. We have some resources for you. Uh, we wrote the book, actually. Uh, it's an ebook uh, that you can download from our website, uh, Definitive Guide to AWS Security. Uh, we can perform AWS Security Vulnerability Assessment for you, free of charge. Uh, so contact us. Let us know that you would like to see you know, how secure is your cloud today. Uh, we'll be happy to do it. And finally, when you look at the uh, analysts, uh, all of them put us on the very, very top of magic quadrants and circles and ovals and whatever else they have. Gartner is one of them, Forrester is the other. We have a whole slew of, of analysts who say that uh, we're right there on the very top of that. Sure. My comment on the vulnerability assessment is, you know, a lot of times, you know, everybody says, hey, we'll give you a free assessment and so forth. Uh, in this particular case, you know, there's a lot of really good data and value that's in there. But rest assured that once you go through that whole process, you know, it can all be deleted and it's gone, and it's not like stored on the back end server, so they know, oh, let's give them a call in six months because we know that this is a problem. Uh, no, it's nothing like that. So it's a really good eye opener to work through, just do the different mechanics. I would highly encourage, you know, to, to test out several different types of cloud access security brokers, take a look at all the different CASBs that are out there to find what best fits with what you're trying to drive. But I know that if you have an AWS environment and you also are moving things into the cloud, both from the past, the SaaS, and the infrastructure component with it, you want to look at a, a comprehensive solution that, that fits a lot of those different needs. And so, you know, that's one of the things that when you 
you know, take a look at the vulnerability assessment. You'll, it'll be an eye opener on how the configuration management is within the environment that you work, but then how does that coordinate and how does that work and lock into your cloud strategy and how your other systems that you have that you want to look at from last wing to security around all your cloud applications. So just a, another way to kind of take a look at it. And it's a very, it's an added value that is, um, I mean, I just can't promote it much as much as I can because it's, it was really an eye-opener for us to work through and navigate that because we wouldn't have originally have thought about putting AWS into a CASB until we saw, oh, we see all this information about the vulnerabilities, but then also now as we take a look at how we set up um, the policies and the enforcement and the actions on how things are to operate in a much larger ecosystem in our larger threatscape, it really allows us to have that better control and automation so that way when we have a threat, we can address it in under 20 minutes where before we may not necessarily have been able to pick it up or, or look at some of those different types of threats in the longer. And I know 20 minutes still is a long time, but it's better than six weeks or six months. Yeah. And with that, uh, we can open the floor to questions. We don't have the mics. So if you ask your question, we'll try to hear it and And we can also it. hang around and meet you in the lobby. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. So you mentioned one of your problems with the rogue users that is emailing uh, by poor network and zero email on the Yes. But you saw like the email or the thing across on Well see that's what's really let, let's of, repeat the question. Uh, so the question he's asking is, how do we address the, you know, the data loss from using a, a, a free email account or other different types of components that are in the cloud itself? So depending on the way your company is, you can obviously put in your, your proxies and other things to capture that. In our particular case, it's a real challenge because we have a lot of talent that use Gmail accounts. We have a lot of you know, creative companies that use a MacMe account. And so, you know, those things are just going to happen. And, and then also, when you think about it, if you're taking pictures of a set to make sure that products or things are in a set way, so if you have to come back and do a reshoot, those photos may be stored onto, you know, their phone, and which may go to their personal cloud storage and everything else. And so a lot of those different things, we have to say, this is a piece of equipment. And so you may have your own phone, but we will check this out on set and it gets checked back in and it has device management. What we have done with our user-centric security architecture piece is, you know, you can't do email on your device unless it's enrolled. And then once it's enrolled, it has to have specific compliance requirements in order for you to even have the application. And so those are some of the other things that we're working with. And, and going down that route, when we saw that somebody's uh, personal iCloud account got compromised and their phone was restored somewhere else, well, because the IDs and everything else didn't match up, it immediately flagged it as a red flag and we were able to shun the device. You know, not because you know, they had the correct certificate or anything else like that, it's just because the actual hardware co coded numbers were, were different than what we had on the system when it reported home. And that's something that is not captured inside the backup itself. But when we come into you know, what we can see from passing the insider threat data from like our firewalls into the CASB or using the CASB as a proxy for our users when they authenticate to different pieces. There's a, a large percentage of that that we do kind of capture when they're in-house, but when they're not outside, we don't actually get to see it. You know, that's where it'd be nice if I can talk to our CASB to say, hey, look, we're box customers, not Dropbox, but we know we have Dropbox. Can you give us some visibility? Will Dropbox be like, no, hey, we can't work with that. But the thing is, is I think we're getting to a shift in, in the world where even though I may not be a Dropbox customer, I can subscribe something to Dropbox to help monitor and manage where my data is in Dropbox and that relationship. And if I can't have that relationship, maybe my vendor can broker that relationship for me to give me that other additional visibility. But you know, it's the same thing as how do you keep people from posting things on social media? Well, you know, there's 518 social media accounts that we work with. Not saying one for each movie, we're saying those are different platforms in different countries and different languages. And so it's really dynamic on trying to monitor and track all that. So we have a whole other content protection division that focuses on that. And it's a different set of tools. But I can tell you in the next year or so, you're gonna see a lot of convergence coming in from those technologies into these technologies as a whole for our, the greater good of the business and the enterprise. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the key is to really have the solution that spans all the cloud services, not just the solutions that want, work with one cloud service at the time, because looking into one cloud is, is just not good enough. You have to, you have to see it all. But yeah, you know, we're getting there. You know, yeah. technology is gonna keep advancing. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, go ahead.
I'm sorry, I couldn't really hear. Yeah, so Envision Cloud itself is hosted in AWS mostly. We have some other cloud services, but the majority of it is in AWS. I'm spending a lot of money with AWS, believe me. It's, it's millions of dollars a month, <laughs> to be perfectly honest, uh, because we're storing a lot of data. We're processing a lot of data. Uh, when we look at the DLP, uh, we're processing petabytes of data on a regular basis. Petabytes, not, mm -hmm. not terabytes, right, for the DLP purposes. Anybody else? Oh, great. Yeah, go ahead. What? Yeah, right there. Okay, so great question. Do I get any pushback from my upper level management about working with AWS because of Amazon as being another content provider? This is a really interesting piece as we get to this whole you know, technology kind of component. Um, so, so I report directly to the CEO. So we're talking about this stuff all the time. And we have always been on the edge of embracing new technology. Because if I lock your system down, then you're going to use a different system. If I you know, make it too hard to do work with this particular solution, then you're going to go find another solution. And that just means, you know, a lot of people think of shadow IT as IT failed at delivering services to their customers, right? So we embrace all that stuff. And we're like, hey, that works for you. Maybe it also works for television, or maybe it works over here for feature. And then let's put it as an enterprise solution. So then the question is, is how do you work with these other different things? So oddly enough, we have a lot of users. And you have to think of it from the perspective this particular case, like an Amazon Echo, right? A uh, particular device that you have in your house. It's not, and everybody gets all kind of nervous about having those in the workforce, but it's not any different than your phone, and whether it's Google or whether it's Apple, because all you gotta do is sit there and keep talking about funeral potatoes, you know, to say funeral potatoes maybe 36 times every hour, and then as soon as you go on your phone and you go to, you know, your web browser, and you go to a Google search, and you type in fun, it will pull up funeral potatoes. And what you've never searched for funeral potatoes on that browser ever before, that's because it's always listening. And so we've talked about these different things when we started bringing in the Amazon Echo and things like that into the workforce of the Google Home products, and it's like, well, it's always listening and everything else. Well, so are these other different types of devices. So there's other legal mechanisms in place to help protect the content. But you know, one of the things that we were really concerned about is um, some of the different folks that are talking about the negotiations for Lost in Space, which is one of our series that we put on to Netflix, right? And so as we talk about the negotiations of that and everything else, well, what would happen if an Amazon decided to say, hey, tell me about all these retro sci-fi shows and start looking at that data and then came across our contract negotiation because it may be in there. What I'm told is none of that is actually recorded, right? So you have to have some relationship and trust with that. But the other thing too is, is understanding what some of those different boundaries are. But again, when we start moving to 5G, all that capability is going to be there always on, whether we like it or not. There's going to be tons of information that's going to be capturing. So we actually partner with Amazon. We are a content creator, not a content distributor. And so a lot of times when you say uh, Netflix original or Amazon Prime original and so forth, it's actually the other different studios that are putting the content and packaging together or in partnership with. So like in this August, we have a show called Carnival Row, which is going to be coming out on Amazon Prime. And it's a period piece with Orlando Bloom. Not a plug or anything, just letting you know that we work with Amazon. So, you know, these different types of things that, you know, where you get into the other different computer, uh, competitive situations are the distributors. So that's why, you know, Disney pulling all their stuff off of Netflix, but yet they own Hulu and different dynamics and those types of things as they go through. So there's like this underlying agreement between all the different studios, and we, we trust each other. Yep. We have a question there. Yes. Why is it taking so long? <laughs> yeah, you know, that was, that was, there's a lot of things around that particular show. One, who would ever thought that the robot's butt would be a trend on Instagram, right? I mean, go figure that. But no, we had to wait for the right timing because season two was actually filmed in Iceland. And so we had to have certain environmental dynamics and everything else like that. So they're done and it, it's all packaged, but you know, the distributor wants to have it released on a set date. So even though it may be all buttoned up and everything else, it's when they want to release it. Sort of like, you know, we may have had Detective Pikachu done years in advance, which it really wasn't, but let's say it was. They want to say, no, nope, your time to release it to the theaters is this date. Do we have any Cosby <laughs> questions? 
<laughs> Security right. questions, anything else? All right. Well, thank you guys right. for coming. Really appreciate it. Yeah, and, you. you know, you can find us wherever you want, you know, in the lobby or LinkedIn. It's all good. Thank you.